Hi, I'm David Glenn, and I'm here with Stacy Krim uh, from the UNC Greensboro University Libraries to do an oral history with Dr. Jay Poole for the Pride of the Community Oral History Collection. And today is Wednesday, 26 June, 2019. Thank you for talking to us today. Absolutely. Happy to do that. Great. Um, well, if we could, uh, we'll just start from the beginning. If you could kind of tell us where you're from, where you grew up. Sure. Um, I grew up in this area. I grew up in the Archdale Trinity community, uh, which is a little suburb of High Point. Um, the Trinity claim to fame is that it is the origin of Duke University. So um, that's my background and that's where I was. Um, I actually lived in that community up till about six years ago right. and I moved to Greensboro. But Greensboro, of course, was the place where we would come to come to the city, so to speak, from right. out in the country. Excellent. Uh, so uh, what year did you arrive at UNCG as an undergraduate? I started as an undergraduate in 1981, so 81, 82, um, school year, and I was a junior. I transferred from Davidson Community College. Um, and lived on campus my junior and senior year. I graduated in 1984 with my bachelor's in psychology. Which, uh, which dorm were you in? Phillips Hawkins, okay. third floor, quite an infamous place back then. <laughs> <laughs> They've remodeled it now and it doesn't look anything like it used to. But, right. Um, yeah, our, our big story on my hall, I, my roommate and I are still very good friends. Um, uh, in fact, he is the senior pastor at First Lutheran Church here in Greensboro, and um, I am his daughter's godfather, so we've remained very close. Um, but our big infamous story is our, our senior year, we broke out a window just before graduation, and they weren't going to let us graduate until we paid for it. So. <laughs> I own one of those windows in Phillips Hawkins. <laughs> Hopefully not one of the ones that they replaced. I know, I know. I hope our window's still there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so um, my next question, actually, and, and I should probably clear up, clarify first, uh, could you talk a little bit about what it was like being a gay student coming to UNCG at that time? And actually, were you out when you first got to UNCG? Yeah. Yes, actually, I was out. Um which was unusual in that time. I actually came out, if you will, in my senior year of high school. So 79, 80. Um, and that all happened because I had found myself a part-time job and a florist in High Point. And of course, all gay people work in florist at one time or another, right? So. Um, I found myself uh, uh, this job, and the owners were two gay men who introduced me to uh, what was then the uh, gay subculture. Um, of course, this would have been right on the uh, right at the time of Harvey Milk, and uh, we're about ten years post Stonewall at that point. Um, and of course, they uh, taught me the gay lingo and the uh, you know, kind of underground uh, ways of communicating. Um, <clears throat> their shop was kind of a hangout spot over in High Point uh, for lots of uh, gay men in the community. And so I was introduced to this notion that there were gay bars and uh, other gay people in the world. Um, and of course, I ran straight back to my friends in high school. I had three other guys that uh, we were all uh, finding ourselves at that time and and taught them all the language and that you know that was it we were out at that point so by the time I got to UNCG I had a couple of years of um, doing a little traveling I actually marched in a drum and bugle corps up in Pennsylvania uh, so that was another layer of kind of exposure to the broader world. And uh, by the time I got to UNCG, um, you know, I had uh, seen things other than Trinity and Archdale and was familiar with 
the the kind of gay culture that existed at that time. So uh, now I will say that while at UNCG, I also had a girlfriend, a pretty serious girlfriend, um, but I had a few boyfriends too. I have to say. <laughs> So that was kind of a, a usual thing, I think, for most people back then. Uh, you kind of had to have a, a cover, if you will. Yeah. And it was that kind of early 80s, right before we knew about AIDS kind yes, of time? Yes, it absolutely was. I often say to a lot of young people that I talk with, uh, you know, I lived some of my best years prior to the AIDS crisis. Uh, and boy, we were, we were wide open back in the day, you know, didn't, that, that wasn't something that was even on the radar at that time. Well, I thought when you, when you were, when you were first a student and first coming out and actually we'll come back to AIDS in just a little bit too, but, um, how did, how, where did you go? How did you meet people at that time? Well, the very first, um, part of that process was, um, <clears throat> meeting a, a person in high school um, we were 16 years old and uh, we kind of both discovered that uh, we were attracted to each other um, and so we we didn't really have any other outlet other than just each other and then we were in the marching band and there was a couple other guys there and we found out that if, that they were gay and uh, so we had this little kind of click and um, secretly, you know, talked about this. And then, of course, uh, as I mentioned, my job at the florist then opened the door to the fact that there was this broader community of people there. Um, and so we met uh, folks at the florist. It, it truly was kind of a social place. Um, a little bit of a seedy part of that, if I can get seedy. <laughs> is there <laughs> there was a an adult bookstore about three doors down from the florist all these buildings have all been raised now at, in high point and there's something else there but um this this adult bookstore was run by this gay guy um we called him edwina and um edwina was the queen of this bookstore and so Obviously, it attracted lots of gay men uh, and other men. Uh, I'm not quite sure how they might have identified, but um, so that was kind of a, a, a social place, if you will. And Edwina would often frequent the florist shop, and there was a lot of banter back and forth, and lots of folks out in the community uh, kind of knew this was a safe place that you could come and. You know, of course, I was a, an 18-year-old younger person then, and that was attractive to lots of folks. And so um, it, was, it was a fun time, and it really opened up my eyes to this broader community. And that led um, myself and my high school buddies to come to Greensboro because they told us about the fact that there was a, a couple of gay bars in Greensboro. And of course we wanted to see what that was about. So we would drive over, you know, on a Friday night and sit in the parking lot just so we could see some other gay people. Um, we were, didn't dare get out at first, you know, to, to break, get through that barrier, but uh, it was quite remarkable. And of course, one of those clubs was uh, what was just recently the financial aid building at UNCG on campus. At that point, it wasn't quite on campus. Um, and, you know, it was a, a known establishment. Uh, the other one that, that was quite popular was um, at the time called Wham. It later became Encore and then Warehouse 29. Um, and one of my friends from high school got to know, well, so I'm left out a little piece there. So we we finally ventured in to the club. Uh, we were all seniors in high school, and we went to Wham one night and braved the door, and we got in. 
maybe because we were cute, I'm not sure. But we got in and that led to one of my friends in high school having a relationship with the owner, uh, the owner's boyfriend. So, <laughs> so it gets a little complex there, but uh, so we, we got kind of passage into Wham at the time and um, started to, to go there rather frequently. In fact, our senior prom, we all took our prom dates to the prom, and then after the prom, off to Wham we go. So, um, yeah. So what, what was the social scene like that? Like, for example, if you were taking your prom dates with you to Wham, was that a kind of thing that happened? Was it? No, they knew it, though. Interestingly, our, our prom dates all knew what the deal was. But, um, no, we did not take them there. Uh, I don't, they may have been interested in going, but I don't know that, they, that we were interested in having them there. Um, it was a very, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of advertisement about that. Um, I don't even remember if there was a sign. I, maybe there was. Uh, but, you know, it was kind of out in this area that, uh, wasn't downtown. It, it was kind of one of those back street spots that you had to know about to to be there. And of course, that's part partly because of the safety reasons. I know now. I didn't think about that a lot then. But um, yeah, it was uh, it was certainly one of the central spots for socialization, meeting other people, uh, that kind of thing. And of course, as we started to know more about the community, we found other spots in the community to socialize. Um, excellent. So, um, as far as far, so, so you say that Wham! and later Encore was probably one you frequented the most. Uh, probably so, yes. There was another club in Greensboro at the time called the Palms, and the Palms was more downtown. In fact, I believe the site of the Palms is where the baseball stadium is now downtown. Um, it was a smaller club, and back then uh, the reputation was that it was more of a, a lesbian club, a women's club. I'm not sure that that was really true, but uh, we didn't we didn't go really find out because we kind of had our spot at Encore. Um, <clears throat> prior to that, there was a club called Davies that used to be on Davies Street, it is the club that relocated to the building that's on the UNCG campus now, from what I understand. Um, and then it kind of went out of, of business. Um, there was a bookstore, not an adult bookstore, a legit bookstore on Spring Garden called White Rabbit Books. And of course, White Rabbit Books was a spot where you could go during the day the clubs were all nighttime, and I think that lent itself to sort of the mystique of the the nighttime nightlife uh, experience of being gay back then. Uh, you, you know, it was you you were one person during the day, and and you kind of uh, vampirishly transformed, you know, to this other person in the night. Yeah, I remember at that time it was the clubs didn't even open until 9 o'clock. Oh, there yeah. wasn't a soul in them. No, 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 no. <laughs> you, you, we got ready to go to the club at 10, and we got there about 11, and we would stay till 3 or 4, and I've, I've driven home before when the sun was rising, so very, very much like a vampire. <laughs> It was it was very much a kind of a hidden dark of night experience, right? Um, but but all along, it was a, it was it was a scene that you liked and you enjoyed. Oh yeah, things. of course, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, when when I first began to understand and realize that my sexuality was different, um, there was no visibility of that hardly at all um you know i was i was not at the age where i was really paying attention to the national news had i i would have probably seen some video of harvey milk and san francisco and that kind of thing and we we started to hear about that later but um you know at the time it was very invisible um 
And of course, I remember distinctly uh, one day Donahue, the old Donahue talk show, had some drag queens on the show. And uh, oh my gosh, that was just unbelievable. So I'm calling up my friends, you know, on our landlines. We didn't have cell phones. And um, saying, there's drag queens on Donahue. You got to turn it on. You got to see this. You know, there's people on there. And um, so, yeah, I think I think what was um, so important to us as young uh, people then was to have this space where you could actually see uh, same-sex couples holding hands, kissing, uh, you know, being together and, and being yourself, even if in the confines of this club that was only open at night and you only did that inside those walls. But that was really quite a remarkable experience. I, I, I can think about now just the first times that I saw people holding hands or kissing or you know, having some kind of affection with each other, because that just was not visible at all anywhere at the time. Right. Well, since you mentioned it a few minutes ago, actually, that one of the next questions I had was actually about the about drag culture and the whole drag scene in uh, Greensboro. Could you talk a little about that? And, sure. You know, um, <clears throat> of course, I'm no expert on drag culture, but uh, the drag culture seems to have... Um, evolved along with the whole gay rights movement um, and and in some ways I think is a, kind of a visible part of the movement um, for lots of different reasons. But in Greensboro, um, back even at that time, uh, there were drag shows, usually on Friday nights at Encore. So uh, if you wanted to see drag queens, that's when you went. Usually the show started at midnight. Um, there were a um, couple of, of uh, house queens, if you will, that were kind of the, you know, the, the folks that were uh, known. And, um, and honestly, I struggle to remember their names, um, but they certainly were icons at the time and really kind of a mouthpiece uh, in many ways for um, entertainment and, and gay uh, identity, really. Um, there was a whole kind of subversion thing that happened there with uh, emulating uh, traditional feminine yet having masculine qualities and and it was, it kind of echoed some of the subversion that was happening, I think, as gay culture evolved at that time. Um, and of course, you know, there, there's been plenty of drag queens that have um, become um, the visible part of the gay community. And I, I think it's all connected up to where we are now with like green queen bingo and mm -hmm. drag queens are reading stories to children in the libraries, you know, and, and so there's that piece of the spokesperson that I think the drag queens are. But of course we love the entertainment value of it. Um, as, as we uh, got a little older uh, and this was still early eighties, but graduated high school and, a good friend of mine moved off to Durham, and Durham had its own uh, culture. The Power Company was the bar in Durham, and beautiful um, bar. It was. It was a great, <laughs> great space. And um, Kelly Ray was the big famous drag queen there, and my friend became a, a drag king. I guess they were. He did boy drag, is what we called it. Right. And so boy drag, um, you know, was kind of a dance, sexual, male persona uh, in contrast to that feminized uh, persona of the drag queen. But Kelly Ray and he were really good friends. And I would go down some and hang out in the drag house. There was about four drag queens that lived together down there. And um, I 
met Kelly Ray several times and, you know, became a big fan. And she used to come in from the ceiling of the power company, drop down on this rope. You know, it was just awesome entrance. And um, so that was, that was, those were cool times. Uh, my, the guys that ran the florist, one of them, and of course they were in their, probably their 30s at the time, although they seemed older to me then. Um, one of them was from Atlanta, and he was friends with Diamond Lil, who's a famous Atlanta queen. Um, I don't think she's with us anymore, but he knew Diamond Lil, and so I got introduced to the notion of drag queens by him. And uh, he had pictures of Diamond Lil, and he talked about, uh, you know, wh who she was and, and what she did. And um, she was certainly a big icon of the Atlanta scene. So uh, I, of course, back in the day, it felt like everybody played around a little bit with drag. You know, it was, it was kind of fun to be in your living room and, you know, find some garments and put on some Diana Ross and go to it, you know. Uh, I was known for my uh, rendition of Sweet Transvestite from Rocky Horror. I was a big Rocky Horror fan. and I had a whole outfit and would do little shows. And then that led to us kind of doing little shows for each other. And that became kind of a fun thing for us to do. Of course, in the confines of you know, a private space, our living rooms or wherever, when our parents were not there, of course, you know. Yeah. So you never, you never were on stage then? I did not get on stage as a drag queen. However, I, I did a lot of theater, mm -hmm. got into that in high school and kept doing that in the community. So I've done a lot of drag type roles in mm -hmm. theater. In fact, right behind me there is a big picture of me in La Cage à Faux, uh, when it was done here in Greensboro back in the 90s. Um, I was um, the dominatrix queen, the s &M queen in the show. And that was really a controversial show. Uh, Community Theater of Greensboro produced it and we had some protesters, not very many, but we had some. But the probably most significant thing about that was that um, the city pulled arts funding from the Arts Council because the Community Theater of Greensboro did that show. Um, and of course my really good friend to this day starred as Zaza in that show. It was, it was quite a production, it was a great production, um, great experience, and really I think for me probably one of the last times that I felt like I was being really subversive with this gay thing because we were doing something that the community had a reaction to. So that felt kind of cool to do that. So I've done drag, but in the context of theatrical shows, not on the typical drag stage in clubs. So you never had really any exposure to like the pageant scene or the whole royal court thing? No, not personally. Now I've been to some of that and I've, I've seen that and um, known some title holders <laughs> in my time, but we used to go down, and this was college days now, we would go down to um, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, and uh, one of the big clubs down there, gosh, what was it called? Was it? There were several big ones in a row that were only open I know, for a while each. Myth, mythos or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway. I remember the gauntlet you had to run at the door when you were getting yes, into the club. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. You, there was a, this is in Columbia, South Carolina. You know, we're in the heart of, of, of southern country. Uh, but boy, it was a big uh, club. And um, the Lady Chablis used to perform there. So I saw the lady perform a couple of times at this club. This was before she got famous with Midnight in the Garden. And uh, they would have big, elaborate drag productions there. Um, so, and, and I met there uh, a guy who was in the whole real pageant world, but he also did drag pageants. Um, and his daughter had been a Miss South Carolina. So he was serious into the whole pageant world and the, the drag 
pageant world. You know, I don't even know where that world is these days. Like, I know there are still drag pageants. A, a former student of mine actually just won a title up in Asheville, uh, but he does a kind of a different kind of drag. But yeah, I don't know that it's what it used to be. It used to be such a big deal, you know. Yeah. I find your anticipating my questions really well because oh, like, the last little part you're talking about about going to Columbia. Uh -huh. uh, did you regularly travel around to other cities and? Yeah, I would say yes. Um, um, yes, yes. Now, I, did we go to every place? No, we didn't. But uh, my crowd, uh, I, I had some friends who actually lived in South Carolina, so that's where we. We wound up in Columbia several times. We wound up in Charleston. That was really kind of a, a planned trip. There was a fabulous club there. I don't know if you ever went to this called the Treehouse. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. It was, it was the club of clubs. Not because it was a big, elaborate space, but because they had the best music ever uh, in, in our minds. And, of course, it was... It was kind of a whisper about kind of club, and it was a mixed crowd for the for the day, um, meaning it wasn't just all gay. It wasn't what you t traditionally expected at the time, um, and we swore there were real vampires there because we would be on the dance floor and about two o'clock in the morning from this staircase, which nobody had ever gone up. <laughs> emerge these people like in capes and top hats and out onto the streets of Charleston they would go you know <laughs> and so we were like oh my god there's vampires here um, so it was really quite an experience to go there um, of course we went to Fayetteville a few times um, gosh I'm going to forget the name of that club too and I will take back I did perform in a drag show at that club as a backup dancer for my friend that used to do boy drag. He, at that point, had been Mr. North Carolina in the pageant scene, and uh, he asked us, me and another friend, and a couple other people to back him up in this production because we spun rifle. My whole color guard existence, um, uh, I had these skills with spinning rifle and flag, and he did too. That's how we knew each other. And, so we had this production that we did there. Wow. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> we, <laughs> had some, like fun. we had a good time. <laughs> that's, that's actually really cool. Um, so you, uh, when you, after you graduated from UNCG to sort of get back on the track, you did stay in the triad area for the full time after that, correct? I did, yeah. I've never really <clears throat> moved um, out of the area, although I've lived in some other different places in the summers because mm -hmm. I would do some of the drum corps, color guard stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, I stayed in the area, uh, definitely. How would, how would you say things have changed, whether, whether the political environment or the mm -hmm. social environment over the past, say, 30, 35 years? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I think, and I often say to people, at that time, and, and I'm talking about the mid-80s to late-80s, early-90s, um, of course the AIDS epidemic had, had come to be and had come to North Carolina. You know, at first it was only in New York City, and it came to North Carolina, uh, and it certainly came to me personally because one of those friends I've mentioned several times contracted uh, HIV and AIDS. and that time he was living in California uh, and he, he ultimately died of HIV in, in 1986, um, 1996. Um, but it, that changed things. That, that became a scary time for a lot of people. There were so many unknowns uh, about HIV and, and what that meant and a lot of misinformation. Um, a lot of people thought, oh, this is not going to happen to me. It's not going to apply to me. I live in, you know, rural North Carolina. How am I going to have anything to do with this? And, uh, of course, we started to learn that, in fact, it, it would apply. Um, 
But I think, so, so all that was the background, you know, the context of that's important because it changed the way people uh, had a sense of freedom and, and free spiritedness and, and probably uh, too much fun sometimes, you know. I think um, as we started to learn more about how HIV was transmitted, uh, it changed the way people interacted with each other, I think. And for the best in, in, in terms of health. Um, but it also um, created this, this negative sense of being um, gay. Uh, it, there was, it was hard to celebrate that uh, in light of the fact that this was literally called the gay plague, you know, and and set out uh, uh, to as punishment, you know, for, for gay people. I mean, this is what the message was at that time. And so it was really hard to find celebratory space in all of that. Um, I think also the gay liberation movement was fueled by some of that. I don't think there's a question about that. And I think the visibility of gayness and, and being a, a person uh, who identified as gay or lesbian or, or alternate uh, sexual expression um, became more visible. It wasn't just drag queens on Donahue anymore. It was Falcon Crest. It was, you know, TV shows started to have gay characters. Um, it, it was uh, movie stars. It was Rock Hudson, you know. Um, so we saw uh, there a lot more visibility, which I think helped to create the inertia that led to what I would say is mainstreaming of, of gay subculture. Um, so conversely, we saw things like White Rabbit Books close down because... You didn't have to go to White Rabbit anymore to kind of give the wink and the nod to somebody that you could talk to them. You know, you, this could happen in other places. Um, the gay bars started to um, see less traffic because you could go to other clubs that were more open and accepting and mixed. Um, I remember right here in Greensboro, gosh, it used to be one of the very first Mexican restaurants in town. Uh, Tijuana Fats. Tijuana Fats, okay. <laughs> so when Tijuana Fats closed, it became a club briefly. <laughs> yeah, I went there <laughs> once too. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of the new club, not all gay, there were plenty of, quote, straight people there, too. It was kind of a mixed crowd. It was a kind of unusual uh, to me because I wasn't used to seeing that kind of blend of people. Um, and then, and, and so that was kind of the new way of socializing. It was, it was more mainstream. It was more open. Um, and I, I see that continuing even today. Um, so today, uh, there's one gay club in Greensboro, um, fairly small. I've never been there, actually. Um, but probably most of the young people, most of the UNCG students today, are probably at Limelight or wherever, which is just an open place for everybody, essentially. Um, so that's very different. There, I, I think... Um, there's been a real shift in the, the notion of a separate subculture, and now it's very blended into the mainstream culture. So it's hard to identify a particular subculture, you know, even drag. I mean, for heaven's sake, one of the top TV shows is a drag queen show, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Who would have ever thunk it, you know? Uh, 
it'd be interesting to hear RuPaul's take on that because <laughs> I remember RuPaul when RuPaul first came out and, mm-hmm. and, and she was a very subversive queen, very vocal about Southern culture. Remember her Confederate flag dress? That was a, a big deal. And uh, now, you know, everybody watches Drag Race. I mean, you know, so it's just, it's just such a part of uh, mainstream culture now. And, and I'm, I'm glad of that in many ways, but the nostalgic part of me longs for some of that underground, dark of night thing because there was something attractive about that, you know, to be a part of a movement that um, was on the fringes. So uh, it's an interesting evolution there. I think you get a lot of that sentiment too from people that were in say underground scenes in New York during the 80s yes, the artists yes. and they go back to New York and say well, it's not scary anymore yeah. I don't what, like what it. happened to the west side right <laughs> yeah because yeah, I you know I started going to New York in the <laughs> mid 80s and you know we went to the Eagle I, if you well the Eagle was notorious in New York City and it still was a little notorious in in that time uh, and the, the meat packing district and all those back alleys and all kinds of stuff there. And now, you know, it's all $2,000 a month rented little studios and it's all cleaned up. And I don't even know if the Eagle still exists or not. I expect if it does, it's just packed full of all kinds of different people. So. It actually does, but it's a big club up is it? now. Oh, is it? Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a different... It's a different space now and and there's positive and negative to that I think um, you know academically um, uh, I've studied some about the gay culture and uh, and this is not an uncommon thing for as people become more visible and, and gain more rights so to speak and have more uh, power uh, they they begin to um, assimilate expand existing culture so you know I I still can't believe that I am still alive in a time when same-sex couples can get married because that was such a foreign concept even in well into the 90s and early 2000s for uh, for me and uh, you know I mean it was only two or three years before that Supreme Court decision that North Carolina passed this law that said you absolutely cannot get married. So it's just remarkable some of the change that's happened. Yeah. Well, marriage and family brings me to the question. I mean, you since you grew up here and lived here in this area generally most of your life, I assume your family's here as well. Yes, they are. And um, adjustments or reactions with them that you would be willing to talk about wow (laughs) yeah so so yeah i'm pretty public with that um in fact um it's not hard to find some of my work um out there in in the world that talks about this um because i've written about this academically um my my doctoral dissertation used autoethnography and so i i've used autoethnography to write some pieces in fact i've got a piece that's out there in a a book called Redneck Sissy and um, talks a lot about growing up in a southern kind of redneck family and culture and um, so you know it's important to to recognize that my parents both were raised in working class white rural subculture in North Carolina and they were both in the Ku Klux Klan they were not active members, but they were members uh, because they were young and, and had me um, in 1962, and that was as civil rights began to really uh, have a foothold in, in our culture. And uh, they saw change, and it terrified them. It scared them to death. And so they retreated, of course, into this kind of reactionary mode of grabbing on to the old ways and um, raised me that way. Um, I I was raised in a very fundamentalist Christian 
household, um, dragged off to the Baptist church. Um, and so I grew up with that, and I, I had that as my frame of reference early in my life. Um, I joined Sons of the Confederate Veterans, and you know I was into the whole, whole thing. Um, and of course, as I began to recognize my sexuality and the fact that it didn't quite fit with all that culture, I, I came into a, an existential crisis, uh, to say the least, and I had to kind of navigate through that. Um, and I think that has been transformational for me. Uh, thank goodness, thank goodness for me. I, I, I'm glad that I had to confront that and go through a lot of hardship um, because it really helped me grow and understand uh, people and, and life and myself much better. Um, my family, uh, at first, of course, you know, I was completely silent and, and did not um, let them know anything about this. Um, you know, it didn't take long to kind of figure it out, I don't think, but course we didn't talk about it and like all good southern families if something's going wrong you don't speak about it it's just left silent um, and that's how it was for me up till I was 28 years old and then finally my mother kind of confronted me about this because I was getting ready to move in with my first partner at the time and um, you know this was a quite traumatic uh, event for both of us, but we got through it and she came around. My father and I never discussed it uh, up till the day he died. We never talked about it, although he absolutely knew what was happening and uh, and grew to I don't I don't know that he accepted it, but he certainly tolerated it in in, a, in the way he could. Um, the rest of my family. Uh, has much m much of my journey has been a lot of acceptance with them. There have been a few um, that have been resistant to that, uh, but just recently cleared a huge hurdle with uh, my last living aunt, um, who is kind of from that mindset of my family of origin and uh, still very much involved in kind of the fundamentalist Christian scene. And um, her son, my cousin, is a preacher and, you know, tr traditional Southern kind of stuff. Um, she uh, was able to meet my significant other and uh, seemed to be fine with that and uh, chats and smiles and laughs and and just has a jolly old time and so while we don't talk about it still it's obvious that it's not something that she has turned her back on me with which is quite an interesting thing um and unexpected really it's a happy thing yeah and it's happy <laughs> it's very happy yeah yeah well, excellent so would you call yourself an activist yes i am an activist but I'm not an activist in what many people think of as a traditional sense. Um, I have marched in a couple of pride parades, but I don't organize pride parades and I'm not out there at the front with the banner and I'm not all over the news and I'm not marching in every you know demonstration. I, I don't do activism in that way. And I certainly appreciate people that do and I value what they do. And, God knows without the early activist, um, you know, where would we be now? My activism really gets to an individual level, and James Sears, who's a scholar in this area, um, he used to be at UNCG, actually, um, he uh, says that a significant way to be activist is at the individual level, to get people, let people get to know you as, an, as a person. And it's much harder for them to hate you and hate a whole group of people when they start to know other people individually. And that's been my primary uh, mode of activism. 
So I tend to um, invite people to know me as a whole person uh, and then let them know that part of who I am is a gay man. Um, and that creates a lot of cognitive dissonance for them. And I see that change. And I've seen that in my family. I've seen that with friends. I've seen that in students through all the years. Um, you know, a lot of people say, do you come out to your students? Uh, I don't ever plan that. It typically will happen. And of course, nowadays, all you have to do is Google, you know, and you find all my stuff that's published out there. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard to um, hate when you start to know someone. Harvey Milk said, you know, and one of his calls to action was to come out. He says, we have to come out. We are, the people that love us have to know us. And I think that is one of the most powerful ways to be active. So in that way, I'm an activist. Um, that said, do you, rem do you remember or have any thoughts on some of the, any of the uh, issues maybe that have come up in the triad area over the years? A few of the things I'm thinking about are maybe like the uh, non-discrimination ordinance that the city council tried to get through in 1990 or mm -hmm. say the Cracker Barrel protests. Do you remember those? I remember those. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And the non-discrimination, actually the non-discrimination uh, controversy at UNCG as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, of course, I, I remember all of those. Uh, I can't say that I was directly involved in any of those. Um, I think probably my most direct involvement in an activist um, incident would have been the La Cage à Faux production, right. which I think was 1991. Um, don't quote me on that, but uh, it was around the time of that city council ordinance. Right. So I think a lot of that was wrapped up together, and this is why the arts funding got pulled. And um, I was actually, my picture, uh, a shot from the show, was on the front page of the, the Greensboro uh, newspaper at, on a Sunday morning, uh, right after the city council had voted to cut arts funding. And this lead story front page was uh, City Council Cuts Arts Funding. I've got that clip somewhere around here. Uh, and so I was the image of the loss of arts funding for the city of Greensboro for a brief moment. So, so that's my claim to activist fame. Uh, of course, I was dressed in high drag with a big, huge purple velvet costume and, and uh, you know, I was, I was out um, and I was an activist for that time. So yes, I think it's, it's been an interesting evolution. You know, Greensboro celebrates today, I just, just saw this recently, um, being the most gay friendly city in North Carolina, which I think is remarkable and that's mm -hmm. great. I'm happy to be living here. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure that's by accident. I think there have been some intentional things that have happened in Greensboro over the years. Uh, I think some of that, in fact, I, I, um, I, would, I would argue that a lot of it is tied to the university. Um, and I remember when I was an undergraduate in, in the early 80s, I didn't dare go to the Pride meetings, but I would go near where they were to see what I could see. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's pretty well documented that UNCG has one of the earliest pride organizations, maybe in the country, maybe the first, uh, on a university campus. And I think that presence, that uh, visibility uh, has fueled a lot of what Greensboro now sees as uh, a celebration of identities and a diversity in this city, because this is a very diverse city to be a Southern small city. Um, we have incredible representation of all, all kinds of people, 
uh, here in this city. So I think that while it's struggled, like, like everywhere else, Greensboro also has this undercurrent. There is something fueling this uh, ongoing diverse population. Um, you know, I remember, uh, and I don't even know when this group was founded, but there used to be the Triad Business and Professional Guild. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Uh, it was one of the first gay business organizations, to my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was founded here in Greensboro. Uh, and, and I don't know if it still even exists in some form or fashion. Probably not. Um, mm -hmm. It's mainstreamed like everything else. But at that point, it was a place where business leaders, community leaders could come together who were gay or who supported gay issues. And that was pretty groundbreaking, you know, for the time. Um, I also remember that uh, Greensboro was a uh, location for one of the first MCC congregations, the Metropolitan Community Church. Troy Perry was the founder of that. And uh, I went to worship there a couple of times in the mid 80s so it that was it was in st mary's house it right? was it was it met in st mary's house originally and then it and i wound up establishing its own facility and now i don't even know if it exists probably not I, i'm not familiar with it at all again mainstreamed but mcc was a, a really important part of the greensburg community um and, and lots of folks came there. Um, so I think there have been aspects of gay life that Greensboro has embraced through the years. And there, of course, have been the resistance piece of it. Um, HIV work, Triad Health Project, you know, emerging out of Greensboro uh, and that leadership trying to confront the AIDS crisis. Another pretty groundbreaking thing for the South, you know. So I, I, I'm really, I'm proud to know that Greensboro has that kind of uh, history and, and also recognize that it's not always been easy and there's been a lot of resistance and there still is some resistance. We know that. You know, I, I think an example of that uh, is that UNCG being as as gay friendly a place as it is, um, still does not have a, uh, a place for GLBTQ plus students to be. While other universities have such centers on their campuses, UNCG does not. And there's always been a rumor that, you know, there's resistance to that in the city in some form or fashion. So uh, I don't know the truth of that, but. I do know that I've been involved since I've been on campus at UNCG and a part of the UNCG community as a professor. I've been involved in efforts to look at these kinds of diversity issues and uh, there's been recommendations made uh, about uh, some needs around that uh, and we've yet to see it happen. So there are, there are efforts there. We certainly have some representation, there's you know, specific uh, spots that, and, and people that, that students can access. But um, so it, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag there, really. Yeah. Um, we finally have a community center here in Greensboro, uh, thanks to Guilford Green Foundation, which is another unique organization. Um, and, you know, I hope that catches on and I hope people can utilize that and will utilize that. Um, but we haven't had that, despite the fact that this place celebrates uh, gay identity and, and GLBTQ plus groups and uh, other kinds of diversity. So it's an interesting mixed bag. Yeah. Better than some places. Better than some places, and and maybe and certainly room to, to grow for I sure. Would, I would bet that you and I would have agreed thirty five years ago. It was not a reputation that we thought Greensboro would have. At this I, I, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Thirty five years ago, I wouldn't have said, "Oh yeah, Greensboro's going to have a community center and a foundation that you know supports 
efforts uh, uh, to do work in the community and and known and and celebrating and proud of its um, uh, status as a gay friendly city. You know, I wouldn't have said that. No. Um. We are doing this interview approximately two days before the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. We are, yes. <laughs> and one thing I'd like to ask you about, I know it's not something you probably thought about directly while it was happening, but what does what does the idea of Stonewall and its effect of uh, years mean to you? What does it make you think of? What 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 is its symbolism to you? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Certainly something I've been thinking about. Um, you know, in 1969, when Stonewall happened, um, I was uh, not in first grade yet. I would, I would enter first grade in the fall of 69. Um, and of course, I, I had no clue about much of anything except being a, a six-year-old at the time. But what I know now is that that same year in North Carolina, schools finally integrated. It took 10 years for North Carolina to fall in line with Brown versus Board of Education. And so I think that is a significant uh, connection there to me that the same year Stonewall happened, launching, if you will, the modern gay rights movement that North Carolina was just beginning to integrate its schools and not resist what the federal government had said should be law. Um, so in New York City, we're, we're seeing an uprising that would change history. And in North Carolina, we're seeing resistance uh, to something that had been institutionalized since the state was founded, uh, and and so how you know how do we how do those things come together? And I think for me, what's significant is 50 years later, North Carolina is much more progressed in terms of GLBTQ plus rights. Um, and Stonewall is now celebrated as a historical uh, monument to civil rights, uh, as the, the overall civil rights movement, the social revolution of the United States. And um, so I think that's a, that's a great movement forward, if you will, in a positive direction. Um, because North Carolina could certainly have found itself 50 years later quite resistant to uh, the notion of gay rights. And while there is a lot of resistance in lots of places in this state, uh, I think there is a lot of movement as well. <coughs> so for me, uh, you know, in 1989, 20 years post Stonewall, I knew about it, but I didn't really understand what that meant for my life. Uh, I was still, you know, a young whippersnapper, and, and yeah, there were some riots in New York City, and, you know, okay. Uh, now, 50 years later, I do understand what that meant for my life. I do understand that without that uprising, there may not have been an organized, orchestrated effort to take us into the 1970s and 80s um, where activism and action and policy and legislation had an opportunity to happen. So I'm very appreciative of those early pioneers. Um, I. I recognize that took a lot of uh, courage and bravery and um, guts and just absolute rage behind all that. <clears throat> I can't imagine what it would have been like to have lived through the 50s 
and 60s when people were still arrested uh, just for being who they were. So I, I appreciate what that movement did. Um, I, in, in my graduate studies and my doctoral studies, I found a, a, a scholar. His name is Arthur Evans. Most people haven't ever heard of Arthur Evans. Um, he was a person who was quite brilliant and went to Columbia University in New York. He lived in New York City and um, wanted to do his dissertation on uh, gay rights back in the 60s and Columbia refused to let him do that. So he dropped out, did not finish his PhD, um, moved to San Francisco and he started the Radical Ferry Movement. Um, Arthur Evans was an activist in the Stonewall era and took that over to California and became really a prolific writer. Uh, one of his books is just amazing, The Critique of Patriarchal Reason. Um, and so I, I'm, I was really happy as a PhD student some 10 years ago to find this person who lived Stonewall and lived uh, Harvey Milk and created Radical Fairies and then inspired me in my own work. So it means a lot now that it's 50 years later. Is there anything I'm forgetting or anything you want to? Um, can you speak to the generational difference between uh, the point in time you were coming out versus our students were and young people were seeing today? today? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Well, <clears throat> it's multidimensional and multifaceted for sure. Um, I think young people today certainly enjoy much higher visibility, um, uh, much higher uh, mainstreaming of gay life, so to speak. Um, uh, in many ways, it... it in some places, it's kind of trendy to, uh, you know, be gay or, or, or something in the blurry lines. Uh, the notion of queerness has come to be, and, and I, I like that. I like the notion of sloughing off identity labels and kind of just being uh, and, and probably identify myself that way more now than, than ever before. But I think in that process... There also is something that's lost, and I think that sense of community and connectedness, um, being a part of that subculture and having language and having uh, symbols and, and scarves in the back pocket and all these things that were part of the identity and the community gave you a sense of connection that I don't know that young people have today. Um, I think it's harder to find that kind of connection today as a young person. Uh, and I think that sometimes uh, the idealized gay lifestyle that we often see on television and in movies now creates a false sense of what it's like to be gay and for many young people, that's not their experience. And so they, they have some sense that something's wrong with them. And I think it lends itself to the levels of anxiety and depression that we're seeing with young people and the astronomical epidemic rates of suicide that we've seen these last few years. I, that's just Jay Poole theorizing. But uh, I, I just feel like if you look on Facebook or TV or in a movie, you know, I'll use Love, Simon, for instance, you know, the recent movie that came out that's just the cutest movie, and it's the, the first real mainstream gay high school love story. Really cool, you know. You got this really good-looking, cute guy, Simon, and he falls in love with somebody online. He doesn't know who they are, you know, and then this romantic ending on the Ferris wheel. I'm Spoiler alerts for all over the place there. <laughs> But if I'm a young gay person and that's not my lived experience and I'm not 
young and cute and pretty according to cultural standards and my parents are telling me they're going to disown me or at least I feel like they are and I'm hearing in church that this is still a bad thing uh, and, and all these messages are really mixed up and I'm not living the love Simon life what does that mean for me and so I get really concerned about that I get concerned about the fact that the reality for so many people is still not positive, yet we see a, a real positive reality often painted in the media, and, and I get concerned about that. So I think we've got to have um, more supportive efforts for young people these days. It's one of the reasons I continue to be an advocate for supportive space at UNCG and on any campus and in, any, and in high schools, for heaven's sakes, and, and places, middle schools, you know, where people are, are beginning to recognize who they are and, 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 and uh, work through their identities, and yet there's not a whole lot of support still, uh, you know. So I, I, I'm concerned about that. Yes, positive on the visibility, positive for the fact that uh, gay life, so to speak, can be um, part of normalized culture, but real concerned about when it's not, then what does that mean for people? Um, is there anything else that we did not cover that you'd like to talk about? Gosh. I, I don't, nothing pops out to me. Um, you know, I, I think if you'd asked me 35 years ago, where do you go? I would have said Encore, the Palms, maybe, uh, the parking lot beside the bus station on mm -hmm. Lindsay Street. That was a spot. The bathrooms at UNCG. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there were places. Yeah. White Rabbit. Now today, if I asked young a young person, a UNCG freshman, who just came here from, you know, some far off eastern rural county, where do you go? I don't know what they would tell me. I, I don't know. What 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 I, I I don't know what you would say. And so that's the piece I think that we've got to attend to, you know. Where do I go? Because um, I knew where to go to be with other people like me. And, and I, don't, I don't know what people would say today. I don't know what their answer would be. Yeah, it's, it's like it might not have been the best possible answer, but it no, was an answer. It was somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was somewhere. You know, you um, you didn't feel alone and you didn't feel isolated. And and today, uh, it worries me. Like, you know, on our campus, where do we go? Well, the multicultural center, if you know about it, you can come there. You know, and Elliot's fabulous, and we've got some good resources there, but. Is that enough? I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. So. Well, thank okay. you for speaking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And. Uh